All righty, brethren. Hello again. Get your authorized version of the scriptures, the King James scriptures, the true and real scriptures, and turn in your King James scriptures to Mark chapter 2. We will be reading verses 1 under verse 12 in Mark chapter 2. I'm answering a question that a brother asked me, and this is how we're going to go about it. So get the book, the King James Scriptures, the True and Real Scriptures, and follow me along in the Scriptures. Okay? Mark chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 12. <clears throat> and again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there, and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Yeah, Jesus is God the Father. Covered that in the last one, last video. But, and immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit, lowercase s there, that they, that they so reason within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee? Or to say, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all. And so much that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. Now this is before the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Father, our Savior, our God, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and by his blood we have the forgiveness of sin. Okay? Come to him as a broken, contrite sinner. You repent of your self-righteousness, thinking that you were worth him dying for, that you're good and that you can save yourself. And there you go. And believe on him. Call on him. Which is the ultimate shoe of humility. Who can forgive sins but God only? Now see, during this dispensation, during the time of the law, man had to go to a priest of the tribe of Levi to, uh, to sacrifice an animal, shed blood, according to the law, for the forgiveness of sins. Under the law, it was faith and works. <laughs> it was not faith alone during the dispensation of the law. That is a lie. Easily debunked. And I have done so. I have done so before in an older video. But, who can forgive sins but God only? Right? The Lord. And today, in this dispensation, there is no priest class. Unless you're, unless you're a Roman Catholic. Right? Turn in your King James Scriptures to John chapter 20, one verse. I 
I was asked about this. So here it is. Who's so uh, John chapter 20 verse 23 pick apart. Oh there of course. Whosoever whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whose sin and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. So that means that the apostles had the authority, like Christ, to forgive sins. I'm going to be reading to you from the Bible of the Roman Catholic. <laughs> oh, all right. All right. We are going to be a we. I'm going to read to you from the Roman Catholic Catechism some pretty blasphemous things. Okay? I want to show you what they what they teach. And then we're going to go through quite a bit of scriptures off of this one verse. Okay? So I hope you're ready. There's going to be a lot of meat here. But you're going to see a perfect example of what is called double speak here. The Jesuits are masters of it. I am going to be reading to you from the Roman Catholic Catechism, the True Bible of the Catholic, on page 402, uh, 402 of the Catechism and 403 on to 404. There are verse numbers 1441 through... 1449. Okay, so now uh, okay. these pages up and down is what I'm going to be reading you. Go ahead and pause it, take a screenshot of it, and then zoom in so you can read it yourself if you don't have one. Also, so where my finger is here is where I'm going to be reading you on this page. Pause it, read it, take a screenshot of it so you can zoom in on it. Okay? All right. Only God forgives sin. This is the uh, Roman Catholic Catechism, the Bible to the Catholic, uh, their verse number uh, 1441. Only God forgives sins, since he is the Son of God. Jesus says of himself, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Power, not authority. And exercises this divine power. Your sins are forgiven. Right here is the double speak. Further, by virtue of his divine authority, he gives this he gives this power to men to exercise in his name. The priest class. The priest class. They're Jesuit priests with the dog collar. They go to confession. And the priest says, uh, you're forgiven and you do uh, 55,000 Hail Marys full of grace and what nonsense. Let's continue. Christ, uh, their verse number 1442. Christ has willed that in her prayer and life and action, his whole church should be the sign and instrument of the forgiveness and reconciliation that he acquired for us at the price of his blood. But he entrusted the exercise of the power of absolution to the apostolic ministry, which he charged with the ministry of reconciliation. The apostle is sent out on behalf of Christ, with God making his appeal through him and pleading, be reconciled to God. Now, yes, we are to preach reconciliation. <laughs> but the Catholic priests 
have no power to forgive sin. Let's continue. The 1443 here. Reconciliation with the church. During his public life, Jesus not only forgave sins, but also made plain the effect of his forgiveness. He reintegrated forgiven sinners into the community of the people of God, from which sin had alienated or even excluded them. A remarkable sign of this is the fact that Jesus received sinners at his table. A gesture that expresses in an astonishing way both God's forgiveness and the return to the bosom of the people of God. And when they say that, they're talking about the church. Fourteen forty four. In imparting to his apostles his own power to forgive sins, the Lord also gives them the authority to reconcile sinners with the church. Boy, ain't that something. So not only do you got to go to a Catholic Jesuit priest to get forgiveness of sins, because you can't do it yourself, like under the law, But no, you got to go to a Jesuit priest. And not only that, you got to be reconciled to their church building system. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, uh, I think I might have a little congestion. <clears throat> might have a little congestion coming up in on me. <clears throat> There we go. <clears throat> Beg bar. And for you Catholics, you need to get saved. Let's continue. This ecclesial dimension of their task is expressed most notably in Christ's solemn words to Shimon Peter. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The office of binding and losing, losing was given to Peter, was given to Peter, was also assigned to the College of the Apostles united to its head. Chapter and verse. Oh, oh don't worry, don't worry. 1445. The words bind and loose mean, Whomsoever you exclude from your communion will be excluded from communion with God. Yeah. Whomsoever you receive anew into your communion, God will welcome back into his. Reconciliation with the church is inseparable from reconciliation with God. They mean the Roman Catholic Church. They mean their church building system. Because according to the Catholic, there is no salvation outside the church. Isn't that right, you Jesuits? Yeah. Yeah. Make sure you only believe. And don't come to the Lord as a broken, contrite sinner. And think that you're good enough to save yourself, too, while you're at it. There you go. Yeah, yeah, you're going there, buddy. Okay. 1446. Christ instituted the sacrament of penance for all sinful members of his church, above all for those who, since baptism, have fallen into grave sin and have thus lost their baptismal grace and wounded ecclesial communion. It is to them that the sacrament of penance offers a new possibility to convert and to recover the grace of justification. See, they have to justify themselves. Not be justified by Christ, by what he did on the cross. 
The fathers of the church present this sacrament as the second plank of salvation. After the shipwreck, which is the loss of grace. 1447. Over the centuries, the concrete form in which the church has exercised... Ah, I got this rust on my Bible. Excuse me, on my scriptures. See? Gotta watch me on that keeping of my uh, speech within line with the scriptures. See, I said Bible. Bad breath. <laughs> the scriptures. Beg your pardon. Okay, beg your pardon. Over the centuries, the concrete form in which the church has exercised this power received from the Lord has varied considerably. During the first centuries, the reconciliation of Christians whom had committed particularly grave sins after their baptism, for example, idolatry, murder, or adultery, was tied to a very rigorous dis discipline, according to which penitents had to do public penance for their sins, often for years, before receiving reconciliation. Through this order of penitence, which concerned only certain grave sins, one was only rarely admitted and in certain regions only once in a lifetime. During the 7th century, Irish missionaries, inspired by the Eastern monastic tradition, took to continental Europe the private practice of penance, which does not require public and prolonged com completion. Com completion. Completion. Completion of <laughs> penitential works before reconciliation with the church. Beg your pardon for stumbling over my own tongue. From that time on, the sacrament has been performed in secret between penitent and priest. This new practice envisioned the possibility of redemption and so opened the way to a regular frequenting of the sacrament. It, is allow, it allowed the forgiveness of grave sins and venial sins to be integrated into one sacramental celebration. In the main lines, this is the form of penance that the church has practiced down to our day. That this sacrament has undergone over the centuries, the same fundamental structure is to be discerned. It comprises two equally essential elements. On the one hand, the acts of the man who undergoes conversion through the action of the Holy Spirit, namely contrition, confession, and satisfaction. You have to do all that to get right with God, huh? And on the other, God's action through the intervention of the church. He can't do it himself, but he has to go through the church. And he doesn't mean like the body of Christ. No, he means the church. But these guys means the church building. Their hierarchy. Yeah. The church, who through the bishop and his priests, forgives sins in the name of Jesus Christ and determines the manner of satisfaction. Also prays for the sinner and does penance with him. Thus the sinner is healed and reestablished in ecclesial communion. 1449. The formula of absolution used in the Latin church expresses the essential elements of this sacrament. The Father of mercies is the source of all forgiveness. He effects the reconciliation of sinners through the Passover of his Son and the gift of his Spirit through the prayer and ministry of the church. God, the Father of mercies, through the death and the resurrection of his Son, has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of our sins. Through the ministry of the church, may God give you pardon and peace, and I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy. <clears throat> Got a little congestion going on here. So, 
Mystery Babylon the Great, the whore, teaches that the priest can forgive you your sin. Here's this. Penance, lesson 29. We are going to read here. This is the New St. Joseph Baltimore Catechism. Okay. We are going to be reading on pages 184, 185, 186, and 187. Okay. Get my face out of there. Pause that and read it. Get a screenshot and zoom in. Pause that and read it. Get a screenshot and zoom in. Okay? Check this out. What is the sacrament of penance? Penance is the sacrament by which sins committed after baptism are forgiven through the absolution of a priest. Penance, the medicine for our soul. The sacrament of penance is a sign. Uh, guess what? Sign, the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. We don't need signs today. I don't need signs. What about you? Like every sacrament, it is a sign of these things, past, present, and future. Number one, it is a sign of the passion of Christ and of his precious blood, which is the medicine he uses to heal our souls. Two, it is a sign of the healing action of Christ on the soul through the absolution of a priest. Three, it is a sign of the spiritual health which the sacrament gives. Whence has the priest the power to forgive sins? The priest has the power to forgive sins from Jesus Christ, who said to his apostles and to their successors in the priesthood, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them, and whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. doesn't say that at all. Go figure. Only God can forgive sins, but he can decide for himself how he wants to do it. <laughs> and the way he has decided upon is to use priests as his instruments. <clears throat> we can truly say that Christ forgives sins using the lips and hands of the priest. Or we can say that the priest forgives sins by the power Christ gives him. With what... <clears throat> Beg your pardon. <clears throat> Catholics. Catholicism. I get, get a little congested. With what words does the priest forgive sins? The priest forgives sins with the words, I absolve thee from thy sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Abracadabra, hocus pocus. What are the effects of the sacrament of penance? What are the effects of the sacrament of penance worthily received? The effects of the sacrament of penance worthily received are, first, the restoration or increase of sanctifying grace. Second, the forgiveness of sins. Third, the remission of the eternal punishment, if necessary, and also a part, at least, of the temporal punishment due to us. Look at all this stuff that this priest is able to do. Fourth, to help to avoid sin in future. Fifth, to restore the merits of our good works if they have been lost by mortal sin. Note, Five, the number of death. Very interesting. Five fruits of a good confession. And when you look into it, 
the Jesuits used the confessional to gain information to do their espionage and all that junk. Yeah, yeah. Five fruits of a good confession. Five is the number of death. Number one, those who are dead in mortal sin are raised by Christ to the life of grace. Those who are sick with venial sin have this life made healthy and strong. Two, just as light drives out darkness, so does the life given by this sacrament drive out the darkness of sin. Three, see question 42, 421, 425. We're not going to go there. Four, the sacramental grace of penance is a spring from which flow the helps we need to keep out of sin for the future. Five, if something like a man who re it is something like a man who returns from a hospital cured and is now able to use his possessions again. What else does the sacrament of penance do for us? The sacrament of penance also gives us the opportunity to receive spiritual advice and instruction from our confessor. Because he's another Christ. Wait for it. What must we do to receive the sacrament of penance worthily? To receive the sacrament of penance worthily, we must first examine our conscience, second, be sorry for our sins, third, have the firm purpose of not sin sinning again, fourth, confess our sins to a priest, fifth, be willing to perform the penance the priest gives us. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Five I wills in Isaiah chapter 14. Satanic. Steps of a good confession. <laughs> Our share in the fruits of a good confession depends in large measure on our preparation. Here are the five steps to the reception of of the sacrament of penance. Think of these steps slowly and carefully. Don't rush. Exact words are not important, but each step must be climbed. That's the whole thing with Catholicism. It's a step ladder. Yeah, you're gaining your salvation. Catholicism is work salvation without the assurance of salvation. <coughs> Beg your pardon. <coughs> And this congestion. <clears throat> Here are these steps. One, examine your conscience. True, two, be truly sorry. Three, have purpose of amendment. Four, confess your sins. Five, accept your penance. What is an examination of conscience? Scriptures say to examine yourselves. How do you examine yourselves? through the scriptures. What do they tell us? An examination of conscience is a sincere effort to call to mind all the sins we have committed since our last worthy confession. Our conscience is the judgment or our conscience is the judgment or decision our mind makes on what is right and wrong. It does not depend on what we feel is right and wrong but on what our Lord tells us is right and wrong. How does he do that? Through the scripture. That's the church. What should we do before our examination of conscience? For our examination of conscience, of conscience, we should ask God's help to know our sins and to confess them with sincere sorrow. How can we make a good examination of conscience? We can make a good examination of conscience by calling to mind the commandments of God and of the church. The Ten Commandments, which nobody could, uh, nobody alive could keep, except one. Jesus Christ, God our Father, God manifest in the flesh. He could do that because, whoop, he's God, Father. Okay, let's continue. But it says, and of the church, the commandments of the church. See the mind control? And the particular duties of our state of life. 
and by asking ourselves how we may have sinned with regard to them. Then it goes on to asking, you know, a questionnaire thingy. And uh, there, that, that, that's enough. One more little thing out of, the ca out of one of these catechisms, then we're going to dive into some scripture. But we're going to get into some, some scripture. Now notice I went backwards on this, okay? This is the main catechism, the Bible, oh, excuse me. This is the main catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, this is the Bible to the Catholic. This one is for like teenagers, adolescents. This one is for little children. I went backwards. Now this one we're not going to take too long. Only two pages. Right there. Note this. See that? See this? If you must, pause it, read it, take a screenshot, zoom in on it. Look at that. Look at that blasphemy. Catholics are not Christians. Oh, wait. You know what? Sure. Yeah, I guess they are, aren't they? Because I am of the Church of the Living God, the body of Christ. They ain't. So, yeah, I guess you could say. <laughs> I guess. Let's go. How to make a good confession. How do you make your confession? I make my confession in this way. I go into the confessional and kneel. I make the sign of the cross and say, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Capital F there. I say this is my first confession, or it has been one week or one month since my last confession. I confess my sins. I listen to what the priest tells me. I say the act of contrition loud enough for the priest to hear me. The priest takes Christ's place. That's what that says. This is my first confession. Need not be taught if there is danger that the children will continue to repeat it in subsequent confessions. The priest takes Christ's place. That's blasphemy. Any of you think that these people, the Catholics, are of the Church of the Living God? <laughs> yeah. Like I said, go ahead and call them Christians. But of the Church of the Living God? I don't think so. Remember you are talking to our Lord. I make the sign of the cross and say, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I confess my sins, number four. I listen to what the priest tells me. Remember you are talking to our Lord. Do not be afraid. Tell the truth. Tell all the sins you can remember. Do not leave out any sinner on purpose. If you forget to tell a sin, God forgives you. Listen carefully to the priest. Remember you are talking to our Lord. Listen carefully to the priest. Say your act of contrition from your heart. What do you do after leaving the confessional? After leaving the confessional, I say the penance the priest has given me and thank God for forgiving my sins. Thanksgiving after confession. Look at the crucifix again. Thank our Lord for his sufferings. Thank him for curing your sins. Say your penance from your heart. Ask Jesus to help you to be better. Okay, that's enough. That's enough. Okay. We get the point. All right. Now, 
John 20, verse 23. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. Remitted. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. The dispensation right here had changed by the way. Christ died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. They didn't need to go to a priest to get their sins forgiven. Because, well, let scripture answer that itself. But, go to Matthew 16. Matthew chapter 16. Uh, you know what? I'm going to use my bookmark there. Matthew 16, verses 13 on to verse 23. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, uh, Matthew 16, verses 13 on to verse 23. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Shimon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Shimon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And he's referring to himself, not to Peter. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shalt be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time forth began Jesus to shew unto his disciples how that he must go on to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and, uh, and the chief spirit at and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised again the third day. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto the first pope, But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Keys. Keys. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Again. We looked uh, in Acts chapter 1 in the previous video, which I have yet to upload at the recording of this. Acts chapter 1, verses 15 on to verse 17. Okay? This does not make Peter the Pope. Okay? But. Okay? Acts chapter 1, verses 15 on to verse 17. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of, his, of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Why did you read that, Brad? Well, we just said, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Christ died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures and um, had ascended. Okay? And Peter, who was not the first pope, was using those keys to introduce these things. 
and then out came the Holy Ghost. Okay, you need a key to open uh, open up a door, right? And the door is Jesus Christ. Okay. Okay. Also now two fourteen through twenty one. Acts chapter 2, 14 through 21. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will shew wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, we see Peter using the keys, but the other apostles also used the keys as well. It was not just relegated to Peter. I did a video I did a video a while ago about Peter not being the first pope. I'm going to link it in this video especially, okay? Especially. So, we see Peter using keys. But then again, the other apostles used the keys, and they were only temporary because we are in the time of the Gentiles. The kingdom, the spiritual kingdom was offered unto the Jewish people after the death, burial, and resurrection. As far as argument goes, if the Jewish people would have accepted the gospel, and then the religious rulers would have accepted that, the second coming would have probably happened right away, and none of this would be going on. But as I said in the previous video, it was prophesied that this is going to happen like this. Okay? Okay? But Peter and the other apostles were using the keys to open the doors of the spiritual kingdom and also for us Gentiles. After, after Acts chapter 7, the Jewish people officially rejected the gospel and it came to us to make the Jew jealous. And hence, here we are in the time of the Gentiles, which it was the time of the Gentiles after the death, burial, and resurrection. And he went up to heaven. Okay? Okay? Get that? Okay. Second Corinthians chapter 2. Second Corinthians chapter 2. Here it is. Here it is. Now when the Lord said that to Peter, it was before the crucifixion. Uh, before the crucifixion. And what he says in John 20, 23 is after the uh, crucifixion. Okay? Remember, before this dispensation, during the time of the law, in order for someone to gain forgiveness, they had to go to a priest, and a priest had to sat make a sacrifice, and they had to make an offering. They, the person, could not, a person, spirit, soul, and body, could not go to God themselves outside a priest. Okay? Okay? You got that? So, let's read this. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. <clears throat> Guess what? We're going to read this whole chapter. Can you handle it? But I determined this within myself. With I, but I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is he then and that maketh me glad, but the same which is made sorry by me? And I wrote the same unto you, 
lest when I came I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I might not overcharge you all. Personal. Right there, you see that? But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, because when one member suffers, we all suffer with it. We are the body of Christ. We are joined one to another by the head, who is Christ Jesus, God our Father. Okay? Okay? Do you get, you get that, right? Okay, let's continue. Sufficient to a man is the punishment. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many, so that contrawise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. Now, I believe he is strictly referring to the individual in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I, per, I, I believe that. Uh, there are some of you out there, my brothers and sisters, which kind of have a question about that. I, 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 I disagree. I think uh, that is a clear reference onto the one in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verses 5 on to verse 7. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Let's read verse 8. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with, the mal neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Going back now to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. Wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. I believe that's talking about that guy who was having a relation with his father's wife. Ew. Okay? I believe that. I believe that. Okay? Verse 9. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. Now watch it. Here's where these Satanists like to tie this mess that they have made together. To whom ye forgave, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. See right there, the person of Christ. And the Catholics say that as the apostle, he was given the authority by Jesus Christ to forgive sins. No. See, we get to go to Christ. We get to go to God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, without the intercession of a priest because Jesus Christ is the priest. There is no priest class. We, us Gentiles especially, we can go directly to God the Father through Jesus Christ. Okay? It does not mean that where he says for if i forgive anything to whom i forgive it for your sakes forgive i it in the person of christ because you ought to forgive one another as christ has forgiven you not for salvation but 
If anyone does a wrong against you, you ought to forgive them. Especially if they come to you and ask you for your forgiveness. Okay? That's what that means. That is referring to a personal thing. Not an eternal consequence. Not at all. Not at all. Remember, under the law, you had to go to a priest to be forgiven. Okay? You had to go to a priest. This is referring to personal, I forgive you for what you did to me. I forgive you for what you did to me. Okay? That was it within the Old Testament to a point, yes. But as far as salvifically, they had to go to a priest. There's only one priest today, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. The priesthood was absolved. Okay? This right here is referring to, like, you come up to me, you're mad at me, and you call me a cuss word. Whoa, man. And then you come, hey, Brad, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. I forgive you. Hey, or something, you know, somebody did something to a brother of mine. <coughs> you do something to a brother or a sister of mine, you're doing it to me. Because you're doing it to Jesus Christ. We are connected to Jesus Christ. If one member suffer, we all suffer with it. If one rejoice, we all rejoice. If one mourn, we all mourn. Weep with them that weep and rejoice with them who do rejoice. Hello? Okay? That's what that means. And in John 20, 20, or in 20, 23, Whosoever sins, whosoever sin ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. That does not mean that they had the power to forgive sins, to get them right with God. No. 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 That means on a personal level. You could forgive that. They could forgive each other back then under the law. But they had to, in turn, go to a priest for a sacrifice. Today in this dispensation, we don't need to go to a priest of man. <laughs> of course not. We go to Jesus Christ, God our Father directly. That's all that is. That's all that is. Let's continue. <clears throat> Furthermore, verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. The door was open. Okay. Talking about the keys again. Reference to it, even though he doesn't say the keys. But, okay. I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor, the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved, and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. And Christ is in you. The Lord is that spirit. And who is the Lord Jesus Christ, our Father? Hello. You have God the Father living in you. You're not another God, no, but you have God living within you, if you are saved and born again, okay? Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, whoa, 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 Matthew chapter 6, Verses 14 and 15. Now note this. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. The Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is the constitution, if you will, of the millennial kingdom. It's all works. 
Okay? It's all works. Faith is mentioned one time, and it's in, O ye of little faith. It's a, not said in a positive light. But, note this. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Today, brethren, your forgiveness is not predicated upon you forgiving someone else. It's not. It's not. This is a work right here, verses 14 and 15. Your forgiveness is predicated on whether or not you forgive someone else. This is before the crucifixion. This will be the constitution, the laws of the millennial kingdom. Beg your pardon, excuse me. Because the king will be reigning on earth. See. Today... In the time of the Gentiles, this dispensation, okay, under the Millennial Kingdom, when the King is reigning in Jerusalem, the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, okay? For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will, forgive, will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Show me that in the Pauline epistles. It says, you ought to forgive as Christ has forgiven you. Your salvation is not fixated to you forgiving someone else. Now, if you decide to hold a grudge, your life is really going to be a shambles. You're going to be bitter. You're not going to get anything done with the Lord. Okay? You're going to go nowhere quick. And who knows whether or not the Lord will hand you over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Okay? Today, our salvation is predicated on repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That Christ Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Okay? And we have faith on Him. Trust on Him. Okay? That is what our salvation is on. Based upon the man, Christ Jesus. Alright? But see, under the Millennial Kingdom, especially in the Millennial Kingdom, you don't forgive people, you're not going to be forgiven. Are you starting to get it a little bit? Because, okay, now, now, Ephesians 4, 32. Ephesians 4, 32. Ephesians 4, 32. Right here, now, we just read in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14, on to verse 15, right? Ephesians, Ephesians 4.32 And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You don't forgive other people. You're going to be bitter. You're going to go nowhere. What are you going to get done for the Lord if you have bitterness in your heart, if you can't get over it? You know, there are enemies of mine out there who had hurt me and whatnot. They've never asked for forgiveness because they're evil. I let them go. I forgive them. At the great white throne of judgment, they're going to have a lot more to deal with 
than my petty little wrath, and my petty little bitterness and holding a grudge. You get it? And also Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, meaning once we are saved, we're going to heaven. You're sealed. You're going to heaven. That's what that means. It's not Calvinism. According to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. You're saved, sealed unto the day of redemption. Guess what? You're accepted in the beloved. Thank you, pardon. Verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he, hath proposed, which he proposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Oh, oh. Sorry about that there, brethren. That, uh, now, let's read verse 12 again. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom, also, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, unlike in the other dispensations which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, catching up, or the resurrection, unto the praise of his glory. And now, Ephesians chapter 2, 13, under verse 22. But now in Christ Jesus, and the Lord is that Spirit, God the Father dwells in you, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord is that Spirit. You are sealed with the Holy Ghost, one God, okay? But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath, both, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Let's read that again. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments containing ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross having slain the enmity thereby. And came and preached peace to them which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit on to the Father. This is only one God. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, 
and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Peter, the first pope himself, being the chief cornerstone. <coughs> Excuse me. No. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth on to an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit, because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and the Lord is that Spirit. And who is the Lord? God the Father, Jesus Christ. Okay? Got that? Yeah? Okay? Now, wait, wait, wait. Colossians, chapter 1. Verses 12 on to verse 29. Yeah. Yeah. Now, note this. What we're looking at in the Pauline epistles, specifically. Does it, have we seen thus far anyone being forgiven by Paul as far as being right with God? What about Peter in the books of Peter? No. No. See, these bozos have taken one thing and made it a doctrine of heresy to justify going to a Jesuit priest. Okay? It doesn't mean that we or the apostles had power on earth to forgive sins as Christ did, as king. See, as king, when he did that. <laughs> okay? It's absurd. It's absurd. Let's continue. If you, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 12, under verse 29. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Yes, but where is anything mentioned of going to a priest? Besides the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our priest. Get it? Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Jesus Christ is God the Father. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in, the, in his sight. If, circle that, if ye continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. A minister, not a priest.
who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, the body of Christ. Not the cathedral buildings of the Catholics. Whereof I am made a minister, not a priest, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, lowercase w. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Are you looking at that? I hope you followed me along in the scriptures that we are looking at. If I didn't say that, please forgive me. I hope you are following me along. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. And 1 Timothy chapter 2 now. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verses 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And, and very quickly, verse 7. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, and a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Not once did he refer to himself as a priest. Go to the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> Go to the book of Hebrews. Now, the book of Hebrews is specifically written on to the Jewish people in the time of Jacob's trouble. This gives them a rundown to the Jewish people what we today of the time of the Gentiles already are aware of. It breaks down the priest thing. That Jesus Christ is our high priest, because you have to remember during the time of the uh, during the time of Jacob's trouble, the Levitical priesthood is going to be reinstituted. They are going to build a third temple. They're going to be doing animal sacrifices and everything like that, as is given to them in the Torah, the first five books of Moses. Okay. They are going to reinstitute everything, and then at a point, the Antichrist, who is going to be a pope, is going to walk into that third temple and say, "Oh, by the way, I'm the one that you are ought to be that you are sacrificing to. I am God." And the Trinity is going to be on the earth during that time. The Satanic. Three person Trinity is going to be on the earth during that time. What is it? The dragon, the false prophet, and the, um, oh, I forgot about the other one, but um, some of you can put that in the comment section if you wish. But the Trinity is going to be here on the earth during the time of Jacob's trouble. Yeah. 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 Good luck with that. But this is a breakdown in the book of Hebrews. Because again, the priesthood is going, the Levitical priesthood is going to be reinstituted. And if anyone has ever noticed that 
The Jewish people of today with the Hasidim, they are not operating under the Levitical priesthood today. They will be during the time of Jacob's trouble, but they're not today. The Catholics are the ones that are doing the priesthood thing, the priest class. The comparison between Roman Catholicism and corrupt Judaism, which is not based upon scripture, which is more based upon the Kabbalah, they're very similar because they all have those same father, little f, the prince of the power of the air, the Kabbalah, <coughs> the Talmud, okay, the Catechism, the Missal, the spiritual exercises. Have you ever noticed that Francis <coughs> You ever notice Francis is wearing a kipper? And also a kind of a prayer shawl? The cardinals and bishops wearing kippers? Hello, you ever notice that, right? At some point during the time of Jacob's trouble, especially when you, they have a pope coming in saying, I'm your God. I personally think during that time, the Jews are going to be like, what, what are you talking about? You're a Gentile. Well, the Antichrist is going to have Jewish origin. I believe that. But it's going to be coming from Catholicism. And the Jewish people are not going to accept that. And the Jewish people are going to realize that those King James Scripture believing Church of the Living God people that love them enough to tell them the truth. Boy, they they were onto something. They're gonna come here. They're gonna come here to the book of Hebrews. That's why it's so significant for the time of Jacob's trouble. Because the priest class is going to be reinstituted. But for today, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. We're going to do some reading here. I hope you can handle it. Yes, this is all in answer to one verse. It's a little in depth, isn't it? It's what the Lord would have me to do. So, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 13 on to verse 16. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The Levitical priests that are going to be reinstituted during the time of Jacob's trouble are going to be sinners, of course. And don't we won't even we don't even have to mention the Jesuit priests. <laughs> come on. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in help to help in time of need. Now Hebrews chapter five verses one through ten. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. 
And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, so as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a pre-incarnation of Jesus Christ, God the Father. Okay? Melchizedek is Jesus Christ. Brother Brian already did something on that. I'm not going to get into it. But Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to read this whole thing. Can you handle it? See, this is so much more than just simply answering one verse. It's the hierarchy of the priest class that Mystery Babylon has today, which is totally unscriptural today, see, in the time of the Gentiles, this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles. Okay? We don't need a priest to go to God. If you are saved and born again, you go directly to the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father yourself. You don't need a mediator because the mediator is the man, Christ Jesus. Under the law, you couldn't do that. And on earth, only God can forgive sins, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he did not ordain a priest class, especially today in the time of the Gentiles. Okay? When he was talking about that in verse 23, and then also in uh, first, uh, first Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 10, he's talking about personal. Without that individual having to go to a priest of men, but rather to the Lord and themselves. See. Okay? Let's continue. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, that's another word for peace. Priest of the Most High, priest of the Most High, eh, priest of the Most High God who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days, nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, Son of God, okay, in the flesh, okay, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was unto whom the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. Yeah, because it was God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, Melchizedek. Easy. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. 
But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. Duh. And here men that die receive tithes. Uh, besides in these uh, fake church buildings, tithing is not required today. Okay? Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Okay? Well, Jesus Christ lives within us. God the Father. Okay? It's our bodies. Okay? Not a building. Tithing is not required today. Okay? So when you hear people about... Uh, Giving your 10% tithe to a church building, that's heresy. One of my very first videos on this channel dealt with the lie of tithing for today in the time of the Gentiles, this dispensation. Okay? Uh-uh. Tithing is... Let's continue. And here, men that die receive tithes. Tithing is going to be reinstituted during the time of executive travel, obviously, because they're going to have a temple to keep up, right? But there, but there here, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witness that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also who received tithes paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore, now this is the significance unto the Jewish people in the time of Jacob's trouble. And also for our instruction and in righteousness today, as far as these satanic, Baalite, Jesuit, Catholic priests who teach you the heresy of going to them in confession. And also that they are other Christs that can forgive sins. Like they did under the old in the Old Testament under the law. See, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed. There, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Okay? For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. The priests are weak and unprofitable. Let's continue. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest. For those priests were made without, without an oath, but this with an oath. By him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And, there, they, and they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an un, 
unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is also he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come on to God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Very important. Now remember, this is a rundown for the Jewish people during the time of Jacob's trouble. We're going to come to the book of Hebrews to be explained to them what we in the time of the Gentiles already are aware of, which they kind of missed out on. But let's read this again. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Jesus Christ is our high priest. The priesthood of the believer, as it is said, is that you and I today, in this the time of the Gentiles, get to go to God personally, without any mediator, beside the man, Christ Jesus, God the Father. See, that is why it's so significant to understand that Jesus Christ is God the Father. Okay? Because, uh, were you following me along here? Were you following me along about Melchizedek? It's Jesus Christ. Our high priest is Jesus Christ. And the priests of Mystery Babylon haven't been given anything but a bad case of emeralds. <laughs> and they're full of themselves and they're full of evil. The Catholic priests don't have the power to absolve people of sin. Only God can do that. Which they, as you heard at the outset of this video, they even confess to. Yes, but they do double speak. Yeah, only well, God can, can uh, forgive sins, but he's given that uh, power on to the priest. So the priest takes the place of God, and so the priest is God, another Christ. And they take 2 Corinthians verse 10. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, and make that into a big doctrine that their priests can forgive sins. When we have been looking at, there is nothing of the sort with the verses of Scripture that we're looking at. We go to the Lord ourselves, our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. And as far as remitting, and I forgive who you forgive, whoever you are remitting, you are forgiving them, not eternally, but they, in this dispensation now, you forgive them, you let them go, they go to the Lord. It's not that the priest absolves them of sin to get them right with God. You get right with God yourself. Guess what? Catholics are lying to you. Let's continue. Uh, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests, which have infirmity. But the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son, who is consecrated, forevermore. Okay? Beg your pardon, brother. All right. Now, Hebrews chapter 8. 
Now of these things which we have spoken, this is a sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, <clears throat> the minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God, when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all the things according to the pattern shew to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Now see, what the Catholics do, they're not doing animal sacrifices, but yet again, the Mass is an actual sacrifice to them because the priest uh, elevates the sun-shaped cookie because they're Baal worshippers, which is perfectly round, their little cookie, and the wine becomes blood. So they're cannibals, okay? But their penance... Their absolutions, their Hail Marys, are all sacrifices in a way. Okay? Catholicism tries to keep people under the law. Their own twisted laws. Okay? <laughs> what can I say? That is what they do. Okay? So, let's continue. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith the new covenant, he hath made the first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth, waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Now, Hebrews 9, verses 6 through 14. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests when always went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year on Yom Kippur. Not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. See, Catholicism is work salvation again without the assur assurance of salvation. You have to die in a state of grace. And if you don't, you might have to go to purgatory. Don't get me started on purgatory. Okay? Verse 10. Which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washing, 
and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. But Christ being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, Catholics, and also specifically the third temple, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained the eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And then it talks about when the New Testament starts with the death of the testator. See? And also, verses 24 under verse 28 in Hebrews chapter 9, For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. The fullness of the Godhead bodily, the express image of his person, God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Okay? Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he all have, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And Hebrews chapter 10, verses 9 on to verse 22. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, not the continual sacrifice of the Mass. Nonsense, heresy, blasphemy. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, that after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission, now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. So you see, there's no priest class today. That's the main point. We have one priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, who we today in the time of the Gentiles go to directly. And here, during the time of Jacob's trouble, when the Jewish people are allowed to build their third temple and it's reestablished the Levitical priesthood, it's all going to come crashing down when the Antichrist says, oh, by the way, I'm your God. 
I'm God. He's going to be a pope, and he's going to look like the Catholic depiction of Jesus. The effeminate guy with the long hair and all that stuff. Yes, he's going to look like that. Okay? For another dispensation. But it's breaking it down for them. And these guys... Uh, have taught so many people that their priests, their Jesuit priests, can forgive their sins. And they take out of, they totally destroy verse 10 in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and John 20, 23. They say that that's their to show that the priest can absolve sins in the person of Christ. Because it's a different dispensation. The individual goes to the Lord as priest. Individually. Personally. And we forgive other people. As we have seen. That's all that means. But we went through all this specifically to attack what these guys say is their priesthood. There are no priests today. It's a lie. It's a lie. There's one priest. Our high priest. The Lord Jesus Christ, our Father. Who we go to without the intercessor of a, especially a Jesuit priest. Or of a son of Levi. Because the way was made plain that we could go to God directly. And our forgiveness today in the time of the Gentiles is not according if we forgive someone else. That's during the time of the Millennial Kingdom. And under the law, you know, things were very different. And see, John 20 Go back there now. John 20, verse 23. Whosoever, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Okay? You are to forgive people. Okay? If you're not going to forgive them, you're going to hold a grudge. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. That's going to be more um, against you here on earth. Because you're going to be bitter. You're not going to get anything done with the Lord. But as far as eternally, they go to the Lord themselves. And notice, this is after the death, burial, and resurrection. We we'll want to bring up one more thing. James. James also is there for the, the Jews at the, of the time of Jacob's trouble. Because James chapter 1 verse 1, James is a servant of God uh, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. Twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. This is written unto the Jewish people. Here's another one that the Catholics like to talk about. James 5, 13 and 20. Uh, thir uh, James 5, verses 13 on to verse 20. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And they have that here in the catechism about the uh, anointing the sick with oil, prayer for the sick. They get it from here. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. The Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. 
our faith. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Again, this is written for another dispensation. There's instruction in righteousness for, here, uh, for us, of course. We are to confess our faults one to another. But again, these bozos take this, take out faults and say sins, like in the NIV. The non-King James says trespasses. Okay? And these bozos take this, verse 14, to make it the anointing of the sick. For the, it's for another dispensation. It's written for somebody else. There's instruction in righteousness, yes, but it's for another dispensation. It's not written unto us. Well, this was a very long, drawn-out explanation of just one verse. But hopefully this was helpful unto you and needful for, um, I think, to abashing the Catholic priesthood. <laughs> Absolutely. <coughs> Excuse me. Good. Yeah. There are no priests today. There's one priest who we go to personally, Lord Jesus Christ our Father. So, that is going to be it for today. Um, I do want to get that um, Catholic disloyalty teaching video done, but um, these, these came up before, uh, ahead of that, and that will be done. Um, I hope this has helped. I hope. Um, I hope so. The Lord be glorified. That's what it's all about. All glory to the Lord. So, anyway, brethren, I love you. Thank you so much for watching, if you do. Um, and we will see you in the next video, whenever or whatever that may be. Okay? Thank you. I love you. In Jesus' name.